<laughs> All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for sticking around. Um, so, you know, our panel here, uh, the final panel of the day is to talk mainly about um, the fourth industrial revolution. I mean, you know, we had um, the steam engine initially, um, and then you had kind of uh, factories, mass production, and then you had digital technology, and those kind of underpinned um, economic activity, how people live uh, and how people work um, for the longest time. And we're on the cusp of the next one, uh, the fourth revolution, um, which basically encompasses uh, Internet of Things, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and the interconnectivity um, of humans and, and machines. And we have a great panel uh, to talk uh, about that uh, with today. Um, I'll start to my left, uh, the founder, managing partner of uh, Hof Capital, uh, Fadi Agob, uh, who was in on an earlier panel, um, and then the co-founder and CTO uh, of Republic and Coinlist, uh, Paul, um, and uh, Munib, the CEO of Blockstack. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Um, okay, so um, let's kind of... Uh, start with opening thoughts, and maybe, um, Paul, if you can give us kind of um, your definition um, of the fourth industrial revolution, and, and why is this uh, happening now? Uh, I, think you, I think you touched on a lot of the key points. Um, I think a lot of it is oriented around that automation uh, piece, around the introduction of technologies like you know, machine learning, um, like the Internet of Things, uh, and ultimately a move towards a more open source and permissionless mode of investing in global infrastructure. Uh, and that allows us to make those investments uh, much more readily with a higher ROI, uh, and really, I think, is the, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, uh, Munib, how do you think this will improve the quality of life uh, for people? And how will this impact them economically? Yeah, I think, uh, thinking about it, w one of the main things that um, kind of like gets gets my attention is we know how to, like humans know how to organize themselves um, in corporations, right, in companies. Uh, we would have some sort of a share in that company and then we would share profits or, or raise capital that way. And, and that has been working well, like, like in, in terms of organizing humans. And I almost feel like that we have taken it to a very different next level where uh, these artificial boundaries of like this is a corporation and only a few people can be a part of it, uh, it's becoming uh, less, le there's less friction there. A very concrete example would be uh, something like Facebook, right? So Facebook would give out stock options to engineers to incentivize them to come and work for Facebook. And early users of Facebook basically didn't see any upside in being early on the platform, right? If you compare that to what's happening in crypto with some of these decentralized protocols, not only that you know, as an open source developer, I could you know, have a day job or I could be contributing to five different projects and I just contribute a limited amount of time, so I can just move in and out of a project very, very efficiently, but the early users and the early community actually gets to have a share of the pie of the initial success. And similarly, capital can come from uh, non-traditional resources, like instead of like going out and and raising money from traditional venture capital, which we're seeing in a lot of uh, crypto is, and with the downsides and, and, and potential problems that, that we all need to work on, that now people have the opportunity to invest in a potential next Facebook. Um, Fari, how do you think this changes um, the concept of work? Um, not just in, for people in technology, um, but for people uh, overall, uh, are we going to see more people uh, working um, independently uh, going forward? Um, will that, will the value creation from that be sufficient to provide them with a kind of a comfortable um, standard of living? So, I mean, on a global level, remote work has definitely been already expanding at an exponential level. And we can see right now there's companies with teams based across 10 plus nations and they're creating some of the most amazing companies today. And the blockchain infrastructure only empowers that further. To Manib's point earlier, not only are the early developers, but the early users 
have the opportunity to literally gain a piece of that larger pie that these companies in the making are potentially going to create. So in his example, if Facebook was on a blockchain type ecosystem when it was first being built, those early developers and even those peop those first 100 peop thousand people or like the first couple of people from Harvard who became part of that system would have gotten awarded tokens or dollars or whatnot from the get-go. So your information is being opted in, but at least you're getting a piece of that pie that you're helping build. Um, you know, kind of seeing, um, I'm sure as you do, a lot of deals come your way uh, mm -hmm. due to your role. Um, how, how do you think the, um, the blockchain industry is helping kind of enable this fourth industrial revolution? Let's not talk about kind of blockchain projects per se, but let's focus more on ones that are enabling interconnectivity, for example, enabling artificial intelligence and things like that. Yep, and I think it was touched on earlier that blockchain it, it is by no means the silver bullet, but it is the enabler of a lot of these, a lot of these pieces. Um, we've seen at Coinlist a few thousand uh, crypto projects that have applied to, to find a way to work with us, and um, many of them are, are experimental in nature. Many of them are experiments in a lot of these new ways of working, and I think a lot of that is the driving force and the, the interesting piece of it is a lot of these companies are by nature decentralized themselves in terms of their team. Uh, they have people working everywhere across the world and finding ways to make that functional. A lot of that is built around the core of the open source community, um, but that doesn't mean that it's limited to strictly uh, technical work or coding work. Um, that could mean things like opting in your data into a data set that is useful uh, for, for companies that are building machine learning technology. It could mean that it's uh, companies building marketplace technology and infrastructure um, that folks are able to then build on top of and uh, create local markets on uh, by benefiting from that you know, global piece of, of infrastructure. And, and do you think that um Let's say, do, do you think that um, blockchain technology in itself um, is, uh, go, it incentivizes people, let's say the decentralization aspect of it, does that incentivize people enough uh, for advancements in, for example, fields like artificial intelligence or uh, processing sensor data for IoT data? Um, or do you need a centralized kind of winner-take-all uh, mentality um, for somebody to actually come and make huge advancements in the field. Yeah, and I know, I know Manib has a bunch of good thoughts on this as well, but um, I, I, I don't think that you can, you know, again, use blockchain as the silver bullet, but more as the platform on which you can build the incentive layers for then, uh, you know, creating that behavior. So blockchain creates this, you know, this shared ledger of what has happened, this shared record for what has happened, uh, and from there you're able to build in mechanisms of incentivizing, let's say, if you were to, you know, unlock your uh, address history for this company to leverage and part of, as part of their data set, then you can receive a fractional ownership in the company. Your in interests end up being much more aligned than they are today. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, actually happy to give a very uh, concrete example for, from IoT. Uh, we, were, we were talking to some, some uh, larger companies uh, that had deployments of these uh, IoT devices. Uh, imagine like a medical setting, like it's a, it's a hospital, and it, the access to that device is a very critical thing. Uh, there's sensitive information on the device, and one of the major use cases of using uh, a blockchain was actually that, that you don't want to depend on any single provider that is running a database that can actually get, get, gets hacked, and then the hacker has access to all of these devices. Right, so in, in many ways, like a, a lot of these use cases, like if, if you step out, if you try to generalize, a lot of these use cases end up uh, pointing to who are you trusting, like where is a single point of failure, and this technology is trying to remove that single point of failure or that single point of trust. And in a way, like that's a very general framework. You can apply it to many systems and you can make those systems more efficient when, when you're doing that. And I think we should also think of, whenever we think of decentralization or, or, or these uh, uh, token eco economies, uh, we should take a step back and think about, you know, how do humans tend to organize themselves, right? And, and going, going further back in history, you would notice that, you know, people used to live in tribes and they would self-organize in tribes and then 
uh, trade would start happening organically in different tribes, and whenever you notice that uh, different tribes would start trading with each other and prosperity level for everyone would go up, right? Now think of like digital lives. We are still humans and it's, it's, we're just interacting in, in a new medium and this technology is a way for us to self-organize without appointing leaders, without, without appointing dictators and you don't have to trust anyone and you can self-organize and if there's value being created in one ecosystem, it can easily be traded with other ecosystems as well, right? So it's, I think that's the fundamental way of looking at this. In many ways, we are bringing the digital life closer to how real life works versus the, the current scenario where we have effectively, you know, uh, these monopolies or these dictators, one of the reasons why people are hating Mark Zuckerberg so much these days is that more information is coming out on the kind of things uh, this, uh, digital lord has been doing in the in, in the past years right. um, and if if you can also maybe expand your thoughts on kind of is there a key component and this is for you Fadi as well is there a key component uh, to this technology that's going to drive this forward meaning is it the decentralization that's key is it the ability the ability to tokenize assets um, is it the ability to do smart contracts um, like is there a particular key component you think that will drive this forward uh, I think for me, the key component is actually incentives, right? In many ways, you can even abstract away the technology. Uh, these ecosystems are fundamentally economic systems. People have incentives to do certain things. And, and uh, take Bitcoin, for example, right? Like, let's say the price of Bitcoin drops. Uh, the protocol self adjusts to drop this thing called a difficulty level to incentivize more people to become miners. So in a way, the protocol is, is, uh, is just working on incentives, and that's the same thing that we are trying to do as well. Uh, earlier in my talk, I said that our strategy is to enable thousands of experiments. So we are actually giving developers the incentives to build on our platform. If we get that right, we don't have to worry about, you know, which application is going to take off or, or try to pick and choose over there. And I would say that, uh, if you can work on incentives, like don't work on anything else. If you can get that right, that might be the one critical thing that, that might help the, uh, this industry take off. Buddy, what are your thoughts? I mean, the one thing I would add is uh, the entire component of peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, and that, that was something we had already explored in the very early days of the internet. And as I'm sure many people here have used services to download music before sort of iTunes became the main provider and other such services, but peer-to-peer -peer was the underlying technology in being able to transfer information from one person to another without having multiple intermediaries. But with blockchain technology combined with peer-to-peer, -peer, you have that, but in a more secure, more transparent at the same time fashion. Um, um, I, think, I think this one's for you, Fadi and, uh, and Paul. Um, and this is something we discussed a little bit earlier, we touched on. Um, you know, in, in previous economic models, let's say, you know, you had kind of the owners versus the workers. Um, will this uh, spark a different, um, let's say, uh, will, 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 will the wealth sharing be different uh, going forward? Or will we end up back with kind of the overlords, be data or otherwise, um, and the workers um, kind of not having equitable share? I, I, I think a lot, a lot of what we're talking about is exactly that piece of, of getting away from that false dichotomy of their employees, their investors, and these are the only people that tend to hold a share of a company, uh, even though those are not the only people that deliver value to a company or create value for a company, uh, much more to a, a, a spectrum of, of value generation. And so to the extent that I am, as a user of Facebook or as a user of any other product of Blockstack, adding value to that product, adding my data, um, adding feedback that makes it more usable. Uh, I am adding value the same way that any employee might, just in a mic more microscopic way, uh, and just the same can be, can be an owner, and in fact, it'd be a great incentive for me to have ownership. Um, and so, you know, parts of that are I increasing the ability to make investments with capital at smaller scales, like uh, Kendrick is doing with Republic and equity crowdfunding, uh, but also it is, is with being able to put your time to use in the same way and s s fractionalize your time allocation across different projects, different companies, uh, different ideas, uh, and, and do your work that way. I mean, one real world example 
we were just discussing and when you brought up that, you know, when, when you're using an application or you're online on a platform like YouTube or whatnot, you have this option to go ad free. And we were just discussing and the lifetime value of a user actually opting to go ad free is over across multiple years, of course, is something in the realm of $3,000 per year. So that just shows you how valuable your attention, as mentioned in an earlier talk, actually is in today's terms. So imagine that amount being equated to some sort of fraction of the company, and you, instead of just opting in to be a free sort of data provider, that $3,000 represented is representing you in the company in some sort of way. I, I just want to point out that uh, there, there's sometimes there's this notion that uh, crypto is also being used for like wealth redistribution or wealth equality, and I'm I'm actually not sure that that is the case. Yes, you're trying to open uh, doors for opportunities to people who didn't have those opportunities before. That's true, but at the same time, like you know, we are very in early stages of crypto. Like the, the, the industry is still extremely small. Uh, I mean, the fact that Paul is sitting right here, and uh, I don't know if, if, you, uh, if people know this, Blockstack's token offering was on his platform, and we were kind of like the first after Filecoin uh, to, to, to be listed there. And, and the fact that we are sitting together here means that how small this, this community is. And I think like we are focusing a lot on the positive potentials but then there are these negative side effects that might end up happening. Like we don't know the kind of uh, distributions that a lot of these projects are using, uh, what the wealth 10 years from now end up looking like or what kind of problems it might actually end up creating. I think it's, a, it's an opportunity. Like whenever you're redesigning something, you have the opportunity to, to get the things right that were wrong earlier, but you also are, there are blind spots, like things that you're not thinking about and things that you can get wrong, which a future generation of entrepreneurs would be sitting at a panel like this, thinking how stupid you know, we were uh, when we did the work that we, we, we are doing. So I think that that's something to, to keep in mind. And uh, Marib, if you can give me your thoughts just to expand on this a little bit further on the future of data, uh, Paul as well. Um, are we, you know, centralized data, um, you know, with these giant monopolies versus uh, data markets where people can buy and sell their data uh, versus open data? Everybody has access to kind of everything they need as part of the protocol. Where are we heading? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I think uh, in, in general, people, uh, you know, as, as, as mentioned, that people don't realize the value of their data and the value of their attention, right? And it only shows up when you try to say that I am willing to pay you to stop tracking me or stop monetizing my data and you would actually find out. Uh, like engineers in, in Silicon Valley know what is, when they're, cal they're doing their calculations for showing an ad to a certain person, they know how valuable this person's attention is. But we, uh, basically got some free products and got used to using the internet in a way where we are expecting services to be free. Uh, it, this wasn't the case in the late 90s, right? Like you're supposed to buy a software license and, and, and install something. But uh, the, the data uh, is, I, I feel like you've ended up paying a much higher price in terms of giving up something that was a lot more valuable. And now what's happening with decentralized system is a correction that you, people are now trying to, to basically realize that this thing is actually worth a lot more. And uh, if, imagine like if, if people who want to show you an ad, very simple example, they need to pay you. It's a very direct market. Like they, you can opt into that I'm, about, I'm willing to share just like this amount of public information and anything more you want to know about me or you, you want my attention, uh, why don't you compensate me for my time and, and, and pay me. And I think that those sorts of markets would be very interesting uh, where you would see some sort of a price that is more appropriate to the actual value of the, of the data that, that it's, it's worth. And um, Fadi, in your opinion, and let's say in your role as a venture capitalist and you see a lot of you know, ambitious technology projects, let's say, um, you know, where is, um, the future, or let's say, where are we heading um, as a people in terms of the integration of 
you know, um, IoT, AI, um, and other technologies that are supposed to make your life easier, but are maybe not quite so um, advanced yet. I mean, how do you see kind of the momentum um, in the industry? I mean, the amount of dollars being invested in these industries speaks for the momentum itself. Um, to comment on our fund specifically, we've had a very significant focus on AI, investing most recently in a company called ASAP, which is actually automating the entire customer service stack for major enterprises. And what that does is it frees these organizations from having major teams of call centers and in the end of the day, it just focuses on delivering value to the consumer based on what the AI system is learning constantly. And that's getting into voice in multiple different layers. And the game there at the end of the day is an accumulation of human capital. So we're looking at companies which have the largest machine learning teams in the world and basing our investments on that. Um, insofar as blockchain, other than, of course, the gentleman over here and the companies they're building, one company that we recently got involved with is called Terra Money. It's a company based in South Korea. And they are creating a stable coin through which you'll be able to make purchases online. Um, similar to think of PayPal, but on the blockchain. What that means is that transactions are going to be cheaper for the merchants, but at the beginning to incentivize users, they're giving widespread discounts as long as you use that currency to transact online. So these are some of the areas where we're excited about. So e-commerce and AI as it applies to major enterprises. And, um, gentlemen, um, just kind of to close this out, I wanted to get your thoughts, your, you know, kind of in general your closing thoughts, and also where do people in this room um, need to focus, you know, be it kind of investment theses or work opportunities or skill set development, um, and just kind of your closing thoughts in general, Fadi, maybe we'll start with you. Um, well, I mean, I, again, as we mentioned before, one isn't advising people to go out and buy a bunch of tokens right now or a bunch of cryptocurrencies or what have you, but realize that this is the beginning of a very exciting new technology. It's still in the experimental stage, so there will be the ups and downs, there will be corrections, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be reading up and trying to educate yourself as much as possible and get involved in, get involved with the sums of capital which you feel comfortable potentially being able to lose, but also understanding that that sum of capital could really put you at the place where you're at the beginning of creating an entire new ecosystem, and that has a lot of potential to scale up. Yep. And I, I think Jeremy was mentioning earlier that uh, in, in general, you know, diversification of, of industry and diversification of skill sets is an important thing, um, particularly for, for regions that have had um, you know, a, great, a great wealth from uh, natural resources and, uh, and, and similar uh, sources, and this is one great opportunity being so early on um, to take advantage of that position of strength and leap into into this kind of uh, you know infrastructure. Uh, but that said, you know all all, all the hedges uh, noted that just blindly investing in a space if you don't understand it or don't have conviction about it, obviously not something uh, that you should do. But understanding where the space is going, the movement towards kind of smaller units of work, smaller units of investment. Uh, is one that you know would would be a value and will serve well. Yep. So I, I definitely agree with uh, uh, with these thoughts, and I, I guess like I would be thinking about uh, this transition where I think like all of us, like for us, yes, we know that digital lives and our online lives are important, but. Uh, if you have to pick, like, I think our physical lives are still more important. Like, you know, people who are around us, uh, the house you own. And I think we don't fully appreciate, like, how quickly the digital lives or the online versions might actually be more important and more valuable than your physical lives. Right? And I think it's going to be a very profound shift, and it might happen faster than you think. And by that, what I mean is that, let's say you, are a sh like you own uh, some property, it might be worth less than the digital property that you own. Like, let's say uh, Naval is an is a, is a investor in Blockstack. I think his Twitter handle, the amount of influence, we saw an example earlier where Kylie Jenner, like, you know, uh, because of her tweet, like $1.7 billion of stock value went down. That's a, that's a 
digital property that she has, and it has a lot of influence, right? So I think we should start thinking about if we are heading that way uh, and digital lives are going to become extremely important, like what are the core principles? What's the DNA of that system? How can we uh, be sure of like our, our basic rights are, are there? Like for example, um, would any of us allow random strangers to just sit in our home and you know just observe us or just listen into our our communications? We'd be like, what? what? No, you know, like we are completely uncomfortable with that. Then how can we be okay with it online, right? Like similarly, uh, what if someone told you that you cannot own a car or a property or or any piece of land anymore? Suddenly you'll feel like you've been degraded from being a human that yes, it's my basic right to be able to own this, right? And yet you don't have that right online, right? And we're, you're okay with that. And I think we, we need to realize that difference and we need to start realizing what are those f fundamental rights that we need to stand for. And we should have that relationship with software where uh, the software respects these, these rights. So you don't think the um, kind of, it's implicit that people know this and they're agreeing to this? Um, you know, not to belabor this point because I want to open it up to questions, but, you know, I met plenty of people who are very happy to kind of have uh, open Facebook profiles, open Instagram profiles, open Twitter handles, and kind of share whatever uh, their life is at the moment. You know what I mean? So there's an implicit agreement, isn't there, uh, that people are okay with, with giving up their data uh, in return for the Dopamine, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, I think the, the best theory I've seen by this is a blog post by Chris Dixon. He's a, he's a partner in Andreessen Horowitz. And he talks about this S-curve, right? The S-curve is that when a new product launches, it gives you a free service, and it gives you some utility, and you are actually uh, getting some utility and benefit out of it, right? At some point, like, it flips over, where that organization is now trying to extract more and more uh, value out of you, right? They, they want to grow, grow their profits. Let's say it's a public company now, it needs to show revenue. And the, the relationship flips, right? Instead of it being beneficial for you, now it's net negative, but you're still stuck in the, in, in the same thing. And I think a lot of people experience that. That initially, like Google started off with, like, by saying, don't be evil. They've actually literally taken that thing off. They, they don't even say that they, this is a, this is a, the company motto anymore, right? <laughs> They're not even going to pretend. Yeah, yeah. Like we're, we're not even going to pretend. And at some point, uh, people just keep crossing the the line. Like uh, it has already reached a state where you know I'm having a private conversation with my wife about something, and I'll start seeing an ad on an unrelated property online. Like it's it's almost like you're scared to type something online because you know that. These, these algorithms are learning about you and they will start like uh, adapting to that. And, and that shouldn't be the relation you should have with software. Software is there to serve you, you own it, and you shouldn't be scared of it. You shouldn't be scared of, of speaking around your, your cell phone devices. You shouldn't be scared of uh, you know, installing something and thinking that, yeah, well, I, I have nothing to hide. Like, it, it gets deeply personal very quickly. And I think a lot of those companies have crossed that line and, and, and gone too far. That's fair. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I want to, I think we have time for maybe a couple of questions, if anybody has any. Uh, the gentleman over there. I just have two questions. One is a bit philosophical, but more uh, like, um, like, let's shift down a bit, back to the title in terms of, it says here, cultural shifts and evolving roles. So technology affects society and how we think, how we behave and how we communicate and how we transact. So if technology is moving so fast, um, a lot of people are graduating and they're obsolete by the time they enter the job market. Like uh, a, lot of, a lot of people don't understand the language of data science or why the IoT is important and how it's related to artificial intelligence and you mentioned uh, machine learning. A lot of people are entering the job market, they're already obsolete. So how does that affect the development of human capital at the end of the day um, when you just have a few technocrats leading like the cutting edge, while the rest of humanity is like trying to keep up behind. So I feel there's a big digital divide. Like we used to talk about, a, like, or we're still talking about like a wealth gap. I think now there's like an intellectual gap of 
how fast technology is progressing and people are unable to fathom or keep up with the rate of change. Um, my second question is a, is a bit technical. Um, it says here that there's the 51% attack is when you basically you have more, com more computing power to overpower the blockchain network. Um, IBM just announced that they have a commercial quantum computer. So how, does quant how can we protect blockchains against quantum computer attacks which can overpower binary computers? Thank you. Um, just to the first question, I'll leave the 51% attack to these gentlemen over here. But uh, that first question in terms of the questions around the people being able to catch up to all this technology and the technocrats leading the world and all, and all of this, but perhaps the question should be what we should do about the current education system. Why are we in a world where we need to pay something in the realm of $50,000, $70,000 for the privilege of listening to someone read out something from their book or read a book out to you basically in a lecture? Perhaps the whole entire concept of universities and education in that sort of method is being replaced in this ever-growing technological world. So those technocrats, the technology, these ecosystems has may, have made it so much easier for you to be able to literally log into YouTube or log into any sort of video provider and get a Stanford education, get an MIT education, as long as you have the willpower to put yourself through that and experience and learn from the world rather than go through these institutions, through these walled gardens of the past. So while technology moves forward, the way to learn also moves forward. So that's something I'd say one needs to think about. Yeah, and to that point, we're seeing a lot more in the way of online courses being developed and, and supplementary means of education uh, on a self-serve basis being developed. Um, and a lot of pushback against the traditional kind of modes of education uh, as being more a rubber stamp on, on a resume and a credential rather than actually a source of uh, keeping up with the world and, and, and the changes in it. Uh, so the availability of that information and, and, and the open sourcedness of that information is definitely a helping point to that. Um, on the second question, uh, there's been a ton of research and work done on quantum uh, computer resistant cryptography uh, and many blockchain projects are looking at that as a, as a means of kind of being resistant to uh, you know, the evolutions that go on there. That said, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, IBM's announcements are, are ones that are going to be particularly jeopardizing to, to the cryptocurrency projects of today. Um, they've made a lot of announcements in the past and uh, are served well by them, but it's not clear that they're delivering the same uh, product that you think they might be. Yeah, just, just to add to that a little bit, um, I, I think uh, quantum computers are, are obviously uh, fairly fascinating, but also not that well understood. Uh, quantum computers are very good at, it's not that quantum, if you have a quantum computer, they're just better at every single type of computation, right? Quantum computers are better at very specific types of computations, and you need to come up with quantum algorithms to be able to benefit for that particular problem, right? So, uh, in, specifically in terms of any encryption, there are algorithms which are uh, quantum resistant, meaning that even if you had a quantum computer, you, you can't have an algorithm that does any better than a, than a traditional computer, right? And that's, that's what uh, uh, Paul is talking about, that there are already encryption algorithms where we know that they are quantum resistant and we just need to use them in, in blockchains. In many ways, if, if suddenly today a quantum computer appeared, uh, all of like you know our financial systems and banking they would that would break down. Worrying about blockchains with quantum computer would be the last thing uh, on our mind, right? So it's it's uh, if anything because these systems are new, you can actually forward proof them, right? Future proof them and upgrade them faster than legacy systems that are more uh, vulnerable to uh, quantum computing. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned 51% attacks as well. I know it sounds like a very, very scary thing. Uh, the reality for 51% attack is that smaller blockchains, like if you're just starting a blockchain, and that's a reason why we actually uh, repurpose Bitcoin's hash power to start the Stacks blockchain. Uh, they, they can be realistically attacked uh, in a 51% attack. Even a 51% attack sounds extremely scary, but basically some miner can uh, try to double spend and publicly people would know that someone is trying to do it like the it's not a it's not a catastrophic uh, scenario 
It, it's a it's a limited amount a, amount of time, and and people would know that someone is doing it, and it can potentially be reversed. But if you're talking about large blockchains, like like something like Bitcoin, the probability that any single person can have that much uh, hash power is actually very low. You're already talking about state level actors, right? So if a state like China is trying to attack your blockchain, again, you have bigger things to worry about than them having you know, the, the, just the raw compute power and, and coming after you. One question over there. Hey guys. So. Um, it's a great panel, great discussion, and what? But one of the things that I find it hard to imagine is is a typical like typical day in the life of a decentralized person. So, Munib, could you could you kind of walk us through like, for example, I'm using Blockstack. You mentioned Naval. Naval had a great tweet a couple of days ago that Twitter is your resume. So, I want to use Twitter. I want to I want to have a public persona, but at the same time, I want to have my data, you know, private to me, and I don't want to hear about a hack where everything gets exposed. So what would be a typical day of using things like you know, Twitter, uh, file storage, so on and so forth, on something like Blockstack? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the mental model to use here would be that who has control, right? Right now when you're using services like Facebook uh, or other centralized providers, they have control. You have no control over what, what's happening with your data. Right? Let's say there are certain things that you wanted to keep private, and there are certain things that you're okay with sharing publicly. Right now, you don't have the power to do any of that. Right? In, in, in a decentralized world with, with block stack applications, all we have done is that we have switched the power back to the people. Like You make the decision that this information I consider sensitive, and I'm not going to share it with anyone. This is the information I feel comfortable sharing with, with a few people, by the way, like our concept of sharing is also, uh, uh, we forget that when you're sharing a file with your friend on Dropbox, Dropbox engineers have access to it, right? Uh, anyone, uh, any, any government uh, who is plugged into Dropbox data centers has access to it. Any hacker that hacks into Dropbox systems has access to it. Any backups that they create, there are backups of backups of backups, and we have tested cloud providers on these things. They have access to it. So, a truly private encrypted storage that you get where data never leaves your laptop uh, unencrypted and only you truly have access to that information uh, is a very powerful thing. And after that, you decide uh, what level of sharing do you feel comfortable with, what level of opting into making something public uh, you're, you're comfortable with, and all we have done is we have just shifted the power uh, back to the users. Um, I think we need to wrap it up now. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, gentlemen, for your contributions. Appreciate it. Thank you.